couple years ago, a longtime labor activist, Dan McCrory, wrote a book called Capitalism Killed the Middle Class, 25 Ways the System is Rigged Against You. He firmly believes that a strong labor movement is the key to saving the middle class. He's our guest today, so stay with us. Welcome to Lean to the Left, home of no holds barred commentary, plus interviews with fascinating people. Some of them top experts, others simply with interesting stories to tell. You'll never know who will show up at Lean to the Left. Now here's your host, Bob Gaddy. Dan McCrory has been a labor activist for 30 plus years and a writer even longer. Capitalism Killed the Middle Class was a finalist in the UK's Page Turner Awards. His novel, You Will Forever Be My Always, was a winner in the 2022 Los Angeles Book Festival. His poetry appeared in the 2020 anthology of California's Best Emerging Poets, and two of his screenplays have reached quarterfinal status in the New York City International Screenplay Awards. Dan chairs the book division of the National Writers Union. His next book will be Leonard Peltier and the Family He Left Behind, a look at Leonard Peltier, the family man, rather than the cold-blooded killer of two FBI agents for which he was wrongly convicted. Dan lives in Southern California with his wife, Terry, and two fussy dogs. Hey, Dan, welcome to the Lean to the Left podcast. Glad to hear about Hey, you say the middle class needs saved and that a strong labor movement is what's needed. Tell me this, from what does the middle class need saved and how can labor unions address that? Well, Bob, the rich and powerful have managed to, over the years, shift a lot of the costs for infrastructure, for health care, all sorts of things, onto the backs of the middle class. And we just can't take it anymore. It's ridiculous to the point that it's actually hurting and killing the middle class. Yeah, I know. (laughs) It is incredible what's going on. But I have to ask you this question. You had a long career with AT&T, 30 plus years, right? And acknowledge that you were well paid, that AT&T retirement benefits are helping you today. So what's the problem? The problem is what's happening to people now. For instance, there's something as far as healthcare benefits, there's something called defined benefits, and there's something called defined, I forget what the other term is, but defined benefits say, this is what you get for your benefits. And the other kind of benefits say, here's so much money towards your benefits. Good luck. Okay. So that's caused a problem at the very minimal level, obviously, but they've gone from doing pensions, which are guaranteed money that is going to save you in your gray older years, whereas a lot of them are going towards now what they call a 401k, which is very volatile because it's matching with the things that are going on in the stock market. So as the stock market rocks and rolls, the your benefits go right along with it. Yeah, yeah. That's what is going on with me, actually, because <laughs> I was gotcha. self I was self-employed for many years, and my retirement benefit was what I could save and put away. So I know what you're talking about there. Now, in a video promoting your book, you say the current situation is rigged, so the rich get richer and the powerful gain more power. Please explain how the system is rigged against the average wager. All the things I just mentioned are different ways that they are rigged. Let's take healthcare, for instance. The rich and powerful, we never see them when we go to the doctor because they've got a whole different system set up for them. And so they never have to rub elbows with the common folk. And there are so many ways in which that has been set up to differentiate between the 1% and the 99%. And if people don't realize that it's going on, it is all too common. And it doesn't take much to discover what's going on. I had a real eye-opener with something I read online called the Powell Memo or the Powell Manifesto. Are you aware of that? Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, the Powell Manifesto. Wasn't that something the Chamber did, Chamber of Commerce did some time back? Yeah, Lewis Powell was an attorney and his claim to fame up to that point was to argue in front of the Supreme Court that tobacco was not addicting. And he had a friend in the U.S. Chamber of Commerce who said, 
retired and all these hippies and these vets coming back from Vietnam saying the only reason we're still there is because we're making money hand over fist. And we want to change the conversation. So he said, I'll, I'll put together something for you. And he wrote this 19-page memo that okay. described in detail how they were going to take over the conversation and the priorities of the nation. And it's worked so well for the last 50 years that, that Nixon appointed him to the Supreme Court. Reagan made copies of it for his cabinet, and every Republican president since Nixon has followed it to the letter. And what I want to do, recently I've called the McCrory Manifesto or Labor 360, in which we got that document and talked it for ourselves. So we put in working people and unions and things like that instead. And 40 years from now, instead of talking about what do the banks want or what do corporations want, we'll be talking about what do the middle class need and want. Okay. With your book, you offer a study guide and a copy of your manifesto, Labor 360, Saving the Middle Class. Can you explain more what that's about? What I've done is I've developed a plan so that we want to be able to get the word out and we need speakers bureaus. That's another part of the plan that Powell put in there. And uh -huh. what I wanted to do was I wanted to teach concepts in my book but in a way that it creates a dialogue. So I wanted to get together, let's say, 10 political activists, 10 labor activists, and 10 college students, and put them in groups of three and interview each other on concepts in the book using my study guide. And that would create rapport among these different groups. And so if there was a march going on or some other kind of activity where we needed to get out to folks to protest or bring awareness, these groups would already be self-made because they got together and went over the concepts in this book. Because I cover everything from the criminal injustice system to the gig economy, universal basic income, all of that. Because I started writing the book as a memoir, I guess you'd say, and I started realizing that people don't know who the hell I am. And why would they want to read the book? So I started looking into all these other things that were coming down the pike and things that I needed to warn the next couple of generations about so that they're fully equipped to to handle those situations that were coming towards them. Okay. How do you expect that to be manifested, your Powell manifesto or your Powell memo? How are you, how do you expect it to be implemented, I guess is what I'm trying to ask you. The, the way to do it is through the labor movement because the labor movement is out there in the community. They're also attached to the Democratic Party in a big way. I think that if we took over the labor unions, we could push this from the bottom up to create this uh, situation to uh, lead us to uh, developing the McCrory Manifesto or the Labor 360, whatever you want to call it. A little bit of hubris. I called it McCrory Manifesto because... I carried around my book and talked on different podcasts and different groups of, about the concepts in the book. And I kept saying, someday, somewhere, somebody's going to come up with a plan. Right. What I didn't realize all this whole time was I had the plan in my book. It's the Powell Memo. You take that and you co-opt it, you change it and to be a, a tool of the of working folks, and right. that, that will make things happen. We, it's already proven to be successful. Yeah. So, hey, Dan, are you working with, with the labor unions across the country on trying to get this thing implemented or what? Yes, actually, I'm, I just started a radio program called Working Voices here okay. in Los Angeles, and we're discussing things like that. And it gives me a bully pulpit to go to different unions say, here's a plan, you should try it out. Are you getting any kind of positive response from the unions? Uh, not yet. When Richard Trumko was still head of the AFL-CIO, he and his chief of staff, read what I written, and he said, good luck with that. Okay. <laughs> so right. that wasn't really encouraging. Liz Schuler is now head of the AFL-CIO, and I think she's a little more receptive to it. I haven't had a chance to really sit down and talk to her about it, but I figured this show is my way into yeah, to different so, unions. Sure, I understand. So you're trying to lay the groundwork. Yes. Uh, yeah, which is smart. Now, you say that there's a well-concerted effort to wipe out the middle class. You say that in your video, I think it is. And you yeah. see it's your job to blow the whistle on that. Why would there be an effort to wipe out the middle class? Who gains from that? The people at the top. We've already seen the way that the corporations have moved jobs 
that were here in the United States and, and provided some foundation to uh, infrastructure and uh, all the things that we needed as middle class citizens. And they've moved these things to thing, countries like Qatar, Mexico, India. All these jobs have moved offshore. And uh, that has left us with an, uh, the inability to, in a lot of cases, pay for our health care. Uh, one catastrophic illness in a family can wipe out your savings and put you on the street. And uh, there's something wrong with the American society that lets that happen. That's for damn sure. We've gone through this situation with the Trump presidency and the Republicans passing that tax law that really benefited the top 1% of the people. In your view, what's been the impact of the Trump, that tax bill, the pandemic, the growth of the gig economy? Has all that worsened the situation? I do believe so, yeah. All you have to do is go out on the street and see how many people are living in tents now or conditions have really gotten worse for the middle class. In my book, I interviewed somebody who had been homeless off and on again for three times. And yeah. he said, the way that you know you're homeless is uh, he's put things in storage temporarily thinking after you ride through this, you're going to come back and get your stuff. And right. they end up, it ends up getting sold because they didn't have the money to pay for the storage rental. And that puts them on the street. That's when you know you're truly homeless. Oh, man. Oh, man, I'm telling you what. And there's increasing numbers of people in that position. Is that correct? That's true. And people think it's the problem, but that's actually an indication of that there is a real problem. Yeah, I live in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and this is a fairly well-off area where I live. And it's amazing to me, you go down the, you go down the road and every other intersection, there's somebody holding up a sign, a cardboard sign, with scribbles on it, homeless vet. Why do we have homeless vets in this country? Uh, that makes no sense to me. I'm in a nonprofit organization where we go and feed them sometimes and help them out with little kids to, to survive on the street because no institution is really able to handle the problem the way it should be handled. We need to work on this together. Dan, do you think that the with the pandemic, a lot of people were forced to work at home. And really, I think that increased the popularity of gig jobs. Hell, I had a gig job for 30 plus years as a freelance writer. But now today, we see a lot of people doing that. Now, has that affected, has that made the situation worse, do you think, for the middle class? I think that in a lot of cases, people who take those gig jobs don't realize the implications of that. They don't realize that, for instance, people that drive for Lyft and Uber, they're having wear and tear on their car, and they're not taking into consideration that, sure, they're their own boss, but are they really? Because yeah. the upkeep on their car, and they're not getting the, the amount of work that it takes to be able to sustain a decent living. It's a temporary fix. It's a Band-Aid. It's not the solution. And what we're trying to, what we're finding out is the millennials are a lot smarter than some of the earlier generations. And it's a no brainer to them that the labor unions represent stability and security. And that's why you're seeing all this upheaval these days because Amazon workers, baristas at um, uh, Starbucks, we have strippers in this town who have chosen to organize because they know that's going to bring them some stability in the future. Uh, wait a minute. Strippers that have formed a union? Is this in yeah. L.A.? You yes, of, in... of course. Yeah, yeah, okay. Even That's... though the first one was in San Francisco. What did you say? The first one was in San Francisco that organized, but that, that club went out of business. But the one here in L.A. is thriving. And what's really great about being involved with this labor show is I get to interview all these people to find out what's how it happened and what their possibility is for the future. Because a lot of other clubs now are catching on to this and saying, this is a good way to, to stabilize an industry that has been stigmatized. That's also what we're finding with the pot shops here in California. They're actually becoming real workplaces. <laughs> the pot shops? Yes. Yeah. The drivers that deliver and the people that cut the buds and all those people are now going 
and becoming unionized. They just made recreational pot legal in Maryland. I wonder if the same thing's going to happen there. It will. Look for the United Food Commercial Workers Union to come into town, and they'll be doing that. UFCW. No kidding. That's cool. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now, down here in South Carolina, we don't have legalized pot, but we do have strip clubs, especially (laughs) here in Myrtle Beach. There's probably, I don't know, half a dozen of them. And some of them are pretty famous, but it's a right to work state. So I doubt there'll be (laughs) much. Yeah. (laughs) The first time in history, there are more right to work states than there are not right to work states. And that's a sad commentary on our times. I'm sure Walter Ruther of the United Auto Workers is rolling over his grave because Michigan chose to go that route. But from what I understand, they just voted it out and they're back to being a, I don't know what you would call a non-right-to-work state. They've taken that out. That's good. Yeah. So there's hope. Yeah. The labor situation in these states, they ballyhoo the fact they bring in these big corporations that come in and provide a bunch of jobs, but the jobs don't pay all that much in many cases, and they forbid organizations. For the average person, it's not so great. That's very true. And one of the other things I talk about in the book, I'm going off here on a tangent. There's a chapter on something called the 1033 Project. It's in my chapter called Soldiers of Fortune 500s. And what the 1033 Project does, it requires the Department of Defense to sell at bargain basement prices some of their surplus, whether it's weapons or any of those kinds of things. And so we've seen this proliferation of of SWAT teams all all over the nation because they've been able to get these AR-15s and in some cases RPGs uh, and uh, tanks and and, uh, Humvees that uh, are anti my Francis L.A. Unified School District got 61 AR-15s and a couple of uh, grenade launchers. What are they going to do with it? It doesn't make any sense. And it's unfortunately another sign of our times. And who knows? Those weapons may end up being used against our own people because of rising problems with the jobs and things like that. A lot of people are saying we don't have enough jobs now for the number of people we have. I think that strikes lead to general strikes. General strikes are where a whole industry or a whole population is affected. Like in France, they have the they, what they call the yellow vest movement there that they're fighting because the government's making them have to wait longer to get their pensions. And I see that happening here very soon. Yeah. Hey, you know what? The other day I read that the LTL truck line, Yellow Freight, yes, bankruptcy and about, I think, 20,000 jobs are going to be lost. 22,000 um, Teamster jobs and a few thousand machinist jobs. Yeah. are now lost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that they tried to, in a backhand way, throw the blame on the unions. Is that true? That's very true. And um, they received numerous loans. Over and Trump gave them $700 million, yeah. and they squandered it. They did not do the things that they needed to do to make the company more viable. And so, yeah, they are trying to blame them because one of the requirements when you've got a union workforce is you've got to provide, put money in the bank for their pension plan. And a lot of companies, rather than do that, will use that money for other purposes like management bonuses and yeah. things like that. And so that's how we get into this hot water and situations like this happen. The Teamsters are now hurting pretty badly despite the fact that they just signed a record agreement with the UPS. Mm-hmm. What do you think of the situation with the actors and writer strike that's going on? I think that the AMPTP, which is the the management of all these different studios, they're trying to trying to make these people come crawling back to take the crumbs that they have left on the table. I have friends that are in the WGA as well as as a reporter. I've been covering these these situations and. And I see that they're doing everything they can to protect their members, but AMPTP has marked a line in the sand that they're not going to cross. And it's going to get worse before it gets better. What's the implications of that for the average person? I think I know that for the writers, 
they're getting less and less money. For instance, yeah. the shows, the binge shows, the shows yeah. on Netflix and all that, they yeah. actually pay less than corporate, the traditional ABC, CBS pays. And it's because the MPTP bargained for less money for, for uh, writing on those particular shows. Wow. Okay. The last time this happened, 2007, 2008, we saw a proliferation of reality shows because they don't require writers because they just set up a situation and run with it. And what's going to happen is AI is going to... What, one of the things that they're talking about is, let's say you're an actor and they f- have filmed you. They're allowed to use that likeness any way they want to under AI. That's one of the things, that, one of the implications that we have to really guard against. AI is... There's some good things about AI, but especially for us writers, but there's also bad things for us writers. So when you're talking about AI, you're talking about artificial intelligence, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. And so we're talking about, what, scripts being done with AI? That's one one thing that could happen, yes. Unfortunately, when that does happen, they're, they're not as good as, as we are yet, but they're, they're getting intuitive leaps that the human brain is capable of. Have you looked in the chat GBT or whatever it's called? Yeah. yeah, I actually, I decided to test it and I said, write something on the PAL memo. So I wrote something and it was very generic and it was very, it was definitely, it was not something I would have written. It was it handled it with baby gloves, I guess you might say. I, I haven't tried it yet, but I don't know why. I think I'm scared to try it, but I, I'm going to have to because I guess it's yeah. so, things are going to come down. It's It'll help you with research because everything pops up at the just a few seconds, oh, yeah. but but they haven't been able to match our imaginations yet. Okay. Oh, look, tell us about your other book that you you've done. Your you will forever be my always. Tell me about that. What's that about? And what prompted? That's, that's my COVID novel. I was uh, we were in lockdown, and so I didn't have anything else to do. So I go out to my office every morning, and, and, and I have Parkinson's disease, and I wanted to know what kind of symptoms I was going to see down the line. So I created this character, Charlie Wise, who has Parkinson's, and he, he cheats on his wife constantly. And once he finds out he has Parkinson's, he thinks he's going to die. Okay. So she she decides she's going to go in the hospital for some cosmetic surgery, and she tells him to leave town. So he goes to first to Thailand, he meets a young lady there, and he falls back on his old ways. But then he talks to a Buddhist monk, talks to a Catholic priest, and looking for ways to make amends for the things that he's done to friends and family over the years. And he doesn't like those answers, and goes over to Morocco, and he talks to a friend who's a Muslim, and he talks to some Jewish people that were that were their whole lives, and he decides he's going to go back and do a 12-step thing and do an apology tour uh, to all the people that he affected when he was uh, growing up in Texas. I don't know how to ask you this, but... So that book draws on the fact that you have Parkinson's. Does it draw on any of your other personal experiences? <laughs> I think I know where you're getting at with this, Bob. I uh, plead the fifth. <laughs> I love it. Okay. So where can people find you, find these books? And you got another one you're working on too. The Pel- is it Peltier or Peltier? Peltier. Pel- yeah, and I actually changed the name recently to Leonard Comes Home because I want to make it very optimistic. And I'm uh, writing that. By the way, on the I always I somebody told me I need to put together a book trailer, which is like a movie trailer, yeah. so that people might see the connection that it would make a good movie. Yeah. So I have it. It's up on YouTube, and as of late, it's got over twenty six thousand views of it. So, oh, cool! Um, and supposedly, I'm talking to Charlie Sheen's people about him starring in it. Oh, cool! That in would... a TV series, yeah. But yeah. the Leonard Peltier thing is probably my going to be going to put me on the map because a book about him hasn't been written for over twenty years, and that last one I think was his own book. He's he in 1975. There was a problem in the Pine Ridge Reservation, which is where Wounded Knee is yeah. in South Dakota. And the, there was a guy who had taken over uh, as, I don't think they call him chief, they call him a governor or whatever of the reservation. And okay. he created this thing called the Goon Squad, 
where they would har- harass the traditional full-blooded Indians. They were like the half-breeds or whatever you want to call them. And so they contacted the American Indian Movement and said, please help us here because we're being attacked. Over 60 people have mysteriously disappeared. Wow. So Leonard Peltier was one of the people that was sent out to, to protect these traditional American Indians. And these two FBI agents in separate cars drove onto the reservation, supposedly looking for this other guy. And it was a big shootout. And what happened was these two agents were killed and three people were charged and Leonard made it to Canada, but the others who were captured and they went to court and they were found not guilty for reasons of self-defense. But when he came back, the FBI said, we're not going to mess that up again. We're going to pin this everything we can on this guy. So they had these depositions from this lady named Myrtle Poor Bear, who claimed she was Leonard's girlfriend at the time of the shootout and that she saw him do it and but she had made an earlier statement and said she wasn't even there but uh, they got him extradited using that false those false interviews also part of a ballistics test that wasn't they didn't include everything that showed that it may not have been his weapon and they used those to actually put him away for it's 48 years now okay and the i've written this book for Joe Biden, because Joe can give him executive clemency and allow him to go home to his family. You said you dedicated it to Joe Biden? That's why I'm writing the book. I didn't dedicate No, I, I want uh, him to read it, but it's most important for him to read it because he's the one that can declare clemency for Leonard. Okay, so he has not declared clemency, correct? Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And you're hoping that he will? Yes, I'm, because the book is trying to show how he's a family man and how he's missed births and deaths and all sorts of events in his family because he's been in prison. Yeah, okay. Hey, you know what? We have a couple minutes. I wanted to ask you what your thoughts are about the political situation today with these characters that are running for president, uh, especially on the Republican side. Uh, got any thoughts about any of that? Actually, I wrote another, I'm working on another book called Worst Case Scenario Election Night 2020. And if Trump declares the martial law, says that the Democrats are, are cheating on the election. And it may sound familiar. Tell me if you've heard this one before. And the American Indians decide that they're going to they're take their country back. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's a parody. It's partly funny and part something one of those action writers would have written. Patterson? How many, his name. How many books you write at the same time? Just a couple, because I have AD. How you do? You write, you write them at the same time. You got them going. Yeah, that's amazing yeah. to me. Well, because one of them is very it's nonfiction. It's very yeah. based on f- facts. Yeah. And I get my eyes start to glaze over after a while with all the facts. So I want something <laughs> fun to play with. So then I go over okay. to the other one and have play time with that. Okay, that sounds cool. Yeah. You know what? There's a here in, in in South Carolina. There's a Indian tribe. It's called the Wakamas, and the chief is a buddy of mine. And he's been trying for twenty plus years to get the federal government to recognize the Wakamas as an official federal federally sanctioned Indian tribe. Sure. The state of South Carolina has done that, but the feds won't. And the reason they won't is. They want they want the Wakamas to prove lineage from the earliest times, like the 1600s, to now. They got to show direct lineage of someone who was a Wakama in that line on succession, and they can't do that. First of all, there weren't any birth records back then. There weren't any, they didn't even write. They wrote on stones or whatever. And they can't, they can't do it. And so the chief had a chance to talk to Joe Biden directly about that. When Joe was running for president, he was here in, at a rally. And the chief cornered him and talked to him about it. And Joe said, oh, he'd do something. Don't worry if he's elected four I years know. ago. That was nothing. That's but anyway, exactly. the, the, well, the reason I mentioned it is because the chief has said, that the Native Americans were the original settlers of this whole area. 
and their land was stolen from them. That's and, true. And he's he says, hey, man, I could take these people to court and go after the rights of all this very valuable land that's around here. And a lot of people would be in deep shit trouble. And he keeps saying that he might do that. Interesting. I, uh, yeah, I would love to see that. Yeah. Because there have been marches over the years uh, protesting the fact that there have been so many treaties broken by, by yeah. our country. Yeah. The whole reason why we signed these treaties with the American Indians was so we could show that we were big shots like they were over in Europe and that, see, we can sign treaties too. We're a big nation because they were new and they had to prove themselves. But in, in a sense, that was a legal snafu because it made American tri Indian tribes some wards of the state at that yeah. point. Yeah. Then, so I've learned a lot about the Native American situation in writing this book. I'm sure you have. Back to politics. What are your thoughts about, uh, let's just talk about the Republicans. You got any, I hear people, I kind of like Nikki Haley. I don't know. What do you think? Uh, Nikki Haley is probably the one who's most palatable to me. Because yeah. DeSantis is, he's trying to make a name for himself as the new Trump, so to speak. Right. And I, I, if I was a Republican, I'd probably go with her. Yeah. Okay. So what about Kennedy? Kennedy is a vaxxer, which I'm not crazy about. And he's said a couple of other things. Oh, he went down to the wall, I guess, a couple of weeks ago. The wall in Yuma, Arizona, which is has, happens to be where my, my daughter and her family live. And oh. he was checking out the wall. And I think he's pro-wall, which I'm totally against. And so I, I I didn't vote for Biden. I did the last moment. I was right. a Bernie guy. Oh, because okay. I, yeah, I think yeah. Biden's a, a, an example of the things that are wrong with the Democratic Party. They threw everything at Bernie. They threw all these candidates, hoping one of them was going to catch fire. And Joe did just a little bit. At that point, everybody else dropped out of the race. So yeah. you could see that it was the fix was in, so to speak. And yeah. but I think he's done a lot by good by labor. And I think that we can build on that. What would you like to see? Who would you like to see if given your druthers? <laughs> this is not going to be a popular answer with a lot of people, but AOC. Was... AOC yeah. She's common she comes from common people and she well, always... she, she was a bartender for Christ's sake. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and she's brilliant. Yeah, she is. She yeah. really is. And she yeah. drives Republicans batshit. Exactly. <laughs> That's a point her favor right there. I know. That's what I like about her. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. So with that, you got anything else you want to say? No, I, I've got a website and a lot of course. Tell me about your website. Let's tell people where they can go to find your stuff and how they can get a hold of you. The best way to do is probably Google me um, okay. because the website's this really long thing where you put in the HTTPS colon, right. Right. and another way is just reach out to me by email, which is real easy. It's writing biz, W-R-I-T-I-N-G-B-I-Z at Yahoo. And that's the best way to, to reach me. And I have a monthly newsletter I send out to about 800 folks and be glad to add anybody on it that wants to know what's going on. It's called This Writer's Journey where I talk about the, the books that I'm writing and also about the stuff that's going on at the radio station. Cool. All right. With that, Dan, thank you very much for being with us on Lean to the Left. I enjoyed talking to you. Thanks, Sam. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this Lean to the Left video and that you learned something as well. Please come back on a regular basis and check out our interviews with guests on topics that I hope you find interesting entertaining and enlightening and you can check out the schedule of upcoming shows guests and topics at podcast.leantotheleft.net you can also subscribe to our audio version there or to our video shows here at youtube and follow us on social media facebook at the lean to the left podcast twitter at lean to the left one instagram at bob gaddy underscore lean to the left and TikTok at, at Lean to the Left. Our goal is to be informative and entertaining as we and our guests comment on the latest developments in the news and about the social issues that concern us all. This is Bob Gaddy signing off for 
lean to the left. Thanks for sharing your time with us.